So thank you so much, uh, Joachim, for the nice introduction. And thank you so much for, for inviting me. Um, so this is my second time to Venice. I've been here in 2008. So back then I just started my PhD work uh, in Munich and I joined SENS. Um, so that workshop was really inspiring and it, it inspired me to move into this field of, of biophysics. So for now, it's of course a great pleasure to be back to, to this exact same place and to have the opportunity to talk to you about our research on RNA and cations and about the challenges that we face when simulating these highly charged systems. So this workshop bridges from quantum to nano. And with this talk, I would like to take you to the world of biomolecules, the nano world of biomolecules. And the two speakers in the morning session already introduced to you how you can approach this world from the experimental point of view. And so my talk is about how to do that with the help of computer simulations. But let me start with a broader overview over my field of computational biology. So the key question that we ask in this field is the question, how can we understand life and living things from computer simulations? And I think you will all agree that if you look at living things from the outside, that they are quite diverse. However, if you move in, if you look from the inside, all living things are very similar. So we are all made up of cells and these cells exist, uh, consist of the exact same building blocks. And these building blocks are shown up here. So we have the carbohydrates, which give us the energy for our, our daily tasks. We have the lipids, which are the main components of our cell membranes. We have the proteins, which are our biomolecular machines, which are um, essential for almost all vital processes in our bodies. And we have the last group, the nucleic acids. And here, the most prominent representatives are the DNA and the RNA. Now, in our work, we want to investigate the structure and function of these biomolecules. We want to investigate how they interact, and we want to see how they respond to changes in the environment. And the tool to do this are biomolecular simulations. And what you can see in this plot is that these simulations have gained significantly over the past few years as measured by the number of papers published on this research topic. And now the reason why simulations gain so much in importance is because they allow us to follow the motion of each and every atom in our system. And this allows us to gain a very detailed understanding of biomolecular processes. So what you see here in this movie is a computational AFM spectroscopy experiment. So we pull away the DNA from this mica surface. So exactly as was mentioned in the previous talk by Simon. Um, so this is what we get from the computer simulations. And I think from this movie, you could already appreciate how much detailed information we get. And therefore simulations are a great way to complement experiments. Okay, so in the following talk, I want to focus on the last group here. So I want to focus on nucleic acids and in particular on RNA. So what is ribonucleic acid and why are we interested to study it? So RNA is most commonly known as the information carrier between our DNA and our proteins. And uh, how this works is shown in this picture here. So our genetic code is stored by the sequence of four nucleobases on double-stranded DNA. In a first step, this information is then uh, transcribed onto RNA, and RNA and DNA contain the same information, the same sequence of nucleobases. In a second step, the information of the RNA is then transcribed into proteins, and in this process, always three nucleobases encode one amino acid. Now, this very nice and very simple picture uh, changed about 30 years ago, and it changed with the groundbreaking discovery of Sidney Altman and Tom Check. So what they discovered is that RNA is much more than just an information carrier. So they discovered that RNA carries out vitally important functions in our body, or more precisely, that RNA is typically involved in almost every vital process. And this discovery was now so groundbreaking because it shows that RNA has many different functions. On the one hand, it can carry genetic code and it is responsible for vital functions. And this makes RNA an ideal target 
for medicine. And therefore, this discovery was awarded with a Nobel Prize because it opened up completely new possibilities to use RNA molecules as RNA-based drugs or RNA-based vaccines. And I think uh, the, the best example are, of course, the uh, mRNA-based vaccines that have been developed during the pandemic. So with this, I can now complement our current view on RNA bi biology. So we have about 10% uh, of our RNA, which is coding and which is translated into proteins. The rest of our RNA, 90% uh, of it is so-called non-coding RNA. And this non-coding RNA is involved in vitally important processes such as protein synthesis uh, or gene regulation. And I will show you in the following talk a few of examples how these RNAs actually look like. So however, for RNA to, to really become active and to fulfill all these vitally important tasks, it needs metal cations. And the cations that are most important and most abundant in our bodies are sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. So why are cations now so important for RNA? The reason is that RNA is only functional if it's folded in the correct three-dimensional structure. So this is very similar to the protein folding problem. However, RNA is a highly charged polyelectrolyte. So each and every phosphate group on the sugar phosphate backbone carries one negative charge. And now the electrostatic repulsion would inhibit the folding into a compact and functional structure. So here, the ions now play a dual role. So first of all, they screen the electrostatic interaction and they bind into specific binding sites and thereby stabilize the three-dimensional geometry even further. The second reason why the cations are so important is that by recruiting metal cations to active sites, RNA can perform chemical reactions that would not be possible from the basic building blocks alone. So in short, the metal cations are essential for the structure and function of RNA. However, there is uh, even one more important aspect, and that is that the type of metal cation is also decisive. So RNA is really picky about its ions. So for example, the large ribozyme you see over here is only active in the presence of magnesium. If you replace magnesium by calcium ions, you can reduce the biological function or even stop the activity altogether. So therefore, cations also give us the chance to control the structure and the function of RNA molecules. And this is exactly where our research starts. So the aim of our research is to understand how cations control RNA biology. And the tool to do this are molecular dynamic simulations. And these simulations are now a great way to gain a detailed understanding of these interactions between RNA and metal ions, because the simulations allow us to really follow the motion with atomistic resolution on the femtosecond time scale. And here is now the basic idea behind these simulations. So what we do is we use Newton's equation of motion to describe the dynamics in the system. So Newton's second law states that force equals mass times acceleration. Acceleration is the second derivative of the position with respect to time. So what I have here is a second order differential equation, or more precisely, if I look at a biological system with 1 million atom, I have 3 million coupled differential equations. And these differential equations, I cannot solve analytically anymore, but I can solve them with the help of supercomputers. So there are now two main challenges that limit the applicability of these molecular dynamic simulations. The first one is the accuracy of the atomistic model that we're using. And these atomistic models are typically called the force field. This is sometimes a bit confusing. So the force field is the interaction potential that, that describes how my atoms interact in a simulation. The more accurate this atomistic model is, the better I can reproduce experimental results and the more realistic I can describe biological processes. 
The second limitation that we have in the simulation is the time scale that we can access. And what you can see on this slide is now a typical time scale of biological processes involving RNA. And you can already see that this time scale is very broad. So it ranges from femtoseconds, which is the time scale that we have to resolve uh, bond vibrations, up to minutes and hours. So the typical time scale where interesting uh, biological processes occur. What you can also see is that with our molecular dynamic simulations, we can cover only a small part of this time scale. So with MD simulations, we can describe biomolecular processes on the microsecond time scale. If we want to go beyond that, we only have two possibilities. We can use enhanced sampling techniques, which are smart compu computer algorithms, which allow us to go beyond this time limitation or we can use coarse grain simulations. And in these coarse grain simulation, we group together individual atoms into beads and thereby create models that are computationally more efficient. Okay, so the following talk uh, is divided into three parts. Um, in the first part, I want to show you how we can optimize the atomistic models. And I will do this for the example of magnesium. In the second part, I would like to show you how cations are involved in structure and function of RNA molecules and how we can combine MD simulation and experiments to gain a thorough understanding. And in the last part, I would like to show you simulation results of lipid nanoparticles, which can be used as smart RNA delivery systems. Okay, so the first question we needed to address uh, almost five years back now was the question, how accurate are these atomistic force fields, in particular for magnesium, because magnesium is so essential for our RNA molecules. So if you have magnesium in water, it, it looks like this. So it's surrounded by a first hydration shell, which consists of six water molecules. And then this first hydration shell is enveloped into further hydration shells further out. Now, when you simulate the system with standard parameters, the problem is that it is impossible to simultaneously reproduce the size of this first hydration shell and the hydration free energy. So the free energy you gain when you transfer the ion from gas into liquid water. The second problem is uh, that you can see over here that the dynamics of water exchange in this first hydration shell is much, much too slow if you use standard parameters. So we were not satisfied with the accuracy here, so we thought there is plenty of room for improvement. So our first step was to develop optimized force field for biomolecular simulations of magnesium. Okay, now I would like to show you how this optimization or the idea of this optimization works. So what you can see here is now the form of this force field of the interaction potential that we use in our simulation. So this interaction potential has two terms. The first term is the Coulomb potential, which describes the electrostatic interactions in my system. And the second part is the 12-6 Lennard-Jones potential, which describes the van der Waals interaction. Now in this Lennard-Jones interaction potential, I have two parameters, sigma and epsilon, which is the effective size of the ions and their interaction strength, which are free to being optimized. And this optimization is done in four steps. In the first step, I optimize the ion water interaction by matching to experimental hydration free energies. In the second step, I optimize the exchange, exchange kinetics in the first hydration shell by matching to experimental exchange rates. In the third step, I optimize the ion-ion interaction by uh, matching to experimental activity coefficients. And finally, I optimize the interactions of the ions with biomolecules by adjusting or by, uh, yeah, by adjusting the binding affinity. So for today, I don't want to go through the details of all the steps. I'm happy to answer questions if you're interested in force field optimization. I only want to focus on the second step, on the exchange kinetics. Uh, and the reason is that this exchange kinetics is really essential to understand how those magnesium ions can directly bind to a biomolecule. And the second reason is getting the exchange kinetics right from the simulations was really the most challenging part. And the challenge is what I show uh, on this slide. So we know from experiments that water exchange kinetics in the first hydration shell of magnesium 
should be on the microsecond time scale. So it is well within reach of molecular dynamic simulations. Now, the problem was that we were able to simulate water exchange at very high temperatures up here. However, when we went down to room temperature, neither we nor any other computational group in the world was able to simulate a single of these exchange events. Now, the problem is we knew that the atomistic models were way too slow, but you can't optimize what you can't even simulate. So what we needed here was a method that is a lot more powerful than usual uh, conventional straightforward MD simulation. And the technique that allowed us uh, to simulate the process is so-called transition path sampling. And transition path sampling is a method that works in general for a system where you have two stable states that are separated by a very high free energy barrier. So in any system where you have rare events, you can apply this method. So this also applies to the quantum world. So the idea is that in this methodology, you focus your sampling on the dynamical bottleneck. And this allows you to very efficiently simulate reactive pathway that connect your two stable state. And for us, this meant we could finally resolve how water exchange look like um, or what the molecular mechanism of water exchange really looks like. And this is what I'm going to show you in this movie. So in the initial state, you can see again magnesium, which is surrounded by six water molecules and I have labeled the blue water molecule. And now in the course of the movie, you can see that for water exchange to happen, you need a second water molecule, the green one, which is coming in from further outside. And you could see the correlated mov movement of the blue and the green water molecule in order to facilitate this exchange. Now, more importantly, we could now finally calculate the rate of water exchange down here. And you can see this is four orders of magnitude too slow compared to experiments. So we were then able to apply our first step optimization procedure. And we created two new force fields. They both uh, perfectly match the structural and thermodynamic properties of magnesium. And we have one force field, which we call micromagnesium, which exactly matches the water exchange rate. And we created nanomagnesium, which is faster compared to the experimental water exchange rate. Now, you might wonder, why would I create a model that's obviously wrong, that's faster compared to experiments? Well, the reason is the computational time it takes to simulate one single exchange event. So this you can see in brackets. If you take standard parameters, it takes 800 years to simulate a single exchange event. That was the reason why we couldn't see it in the first place. Simply, it takes so long to do it. With micromagnesium, it takes about five weeks. With nanomagnesium, you're down to one hour. And now you can use this nanomagnesium to, um, to predict binding sites on biomolecules simply because you have such a, such a fast exchange rate that by running straightforward simulation, you can see to which places on a biomolecule a magnesium ion would bind. And this is what I would like to show you on this slide. So what you can see here, is the ribosome. The ribosome is the molecular machine that uh, synthesizes proteins in our bodies. Um, so the ribosome consists of a mix of RNA in green and proteins in black. This is a one round view. The system consists of about 2 million atoms. This is now a zoom in on the peptidyl transfer center where protein synthesis takes place. And in blue, you can now see from the simulations the cloud of magnesium ions surrounding the center. And you can see uh, this is actually a bit weird, so this should usually not show up, but in principle, you can see red dots in here, which are the magnesium binding sites um, in this transfer center. Okay, so this now brings me to, to the second part, um, and here I would like to discuss how the cations change the structure and function of nucleic acids. Um, and I have two examples. The first example is DNA. And DNA is a really a great biomolecule to show how cations can influence the structure because DNA forms the well-known double helical structure. <clears throat> so um, if you look at DNA, you have complementary base pairing and therefore it will form a ladder-like structure. However, now the backbone is highly charged and it likes to interact with the solvent while the nucleobases are hydrophobic. So they don't want to be solvent exposed. So what the DNA does, it does a trick. It will start to twist in such a way that the nucleobases are no longer solvent exposed. 
Um, and now if you have physiological salt concentration, this twist corresponds to uh, exactly 10.5 base pairs to complete one full turn. However, if you now change the ionic conditions, this twist will also change. So if you change the salt concentration or the ion type, you get a different twist. So in order to, to exactly characterize the effect, we here combined our magnetic tweezer experiments, which were done in the group of Jan Lipford, uh, and in these simulations. And in these magnetic tweezer experiments, a DNA is tethered between a solid surface, and up here you have a magnetic bead. And this setup allows you to very precisely measure the twist of the DNA. And now in the MD simulation, we model a part of the system and also directly calculate the twist. <clears throat> So here you can now see the result, which is the twist of the DNA as function of the salt concentration for two monovalent ions and for two divalent ions. And if you look at this, you can see two effects that salt can have on, on, on the uh, twist of DNA. So first of all, you can see that the twist increases if you increase the salt concentration, and that might be expected due to screening, right? So if you have more screening, you might expect a more twisted and more compact structure. The second effect is more surprising. So what you can see is that some ions like lithium are more efficient to induce twist compared to sodium, meaning that I, I need less sodium ions, uh, lithium ions to induce the same twist as in a sodium solution. Now, what you can also see, and I think this is important, you can see that the experiments and the simulations, so filled and open symbols, they really agree very, very well. And this means we can now use them, these simulations, to resolve the origin of this ion specificity. Okay, and this is how the situation looks like in lithium chloride. You can see in pink the lithium ions, you can see the motion of the DNA molecule, and you can see that the lithium ions preferentially bind to the backbone of the DNA, and that they exchange very rarely with the um, surrounding solvent. This binding pattern is also nicely shown over here. This is a projection onto helical coordinates. This is basically looking from the top view of an untwisted DNA molecule. Now, if you look at the situation in sodium chloride, it looks very, very different. So we will immediately notice that you have these very rapid exchanges of the sodium ions with the surrounding solvent molecules. And in this projection, you can also see that the binding pattern is completely different. So the sodium ions, they move deeper into the DNA and bind to the nucleobases. So in summary, what, what this means is that in lithium chloride solution, we have few exchanges of the ions with the surrounding solvent. Therefore, we have a very stiff and very twisted DNA molecule. In sodium chloride solution, we have frequent exchanges of the ions with the solvent. Therefore, we have a flexible DNA structure that is less twisted. In summary, this also means that we can simply take different ions to change the structure of DNA. And this is important in processes such as DNA condensation, but which is also important in DNA nanotechnology. Okay, for the second example, I have chosen a riboswitch. And riboswitches are, are really important because they control gene regulation. Um, and these molecules can have two, two states, just as a macroscopic switch. They can be on or off. And in the off state, the conformation of the riboswitch is such that the ribosomal binding site is hidden, and therefore the ribosome cannot um, attach and protein synthesis is inhibited. Now, upon binding of a specific ligand, the, uh, the molecule will switch to a different conformation. And due to this conformational change, the ribosomal binding site will become accessible and protein synthesis can be initiated. Now, the riboswitch that we looked at in, in this project is the so-called guanidine 2 riboswitch. Um, and this riboswitch is um, important because it senses and controls the amount of guanidinium ions in a cell. And this is important because two high levels of guanidinium are toxic. 
Now, we wanted to investigate how this regulatory function depends on the magnesium concentration. And to do that, we combine coarse grain simulations and single molecule FRET experiments. So what our colleagues here did in the group of Martin Hengesbach, they attached fluorophores at strategical positions on this riboswitch. And in this experiment, they can measure the threat, um, the threat efficiency. And now what we do in the simulation is exactly the same thing. We use an implicit model also for the fluorophores and calculate back on this threat efficiency. Okay, and this is how it looks like. So you can see the, the result, namely the threat efficiency as a function of the magnesium concentration. And what you can see is that uh, the system can have three different states at low, intermediate, and high thread efficiency. And by changing the magnesium uh, concentration, you can switch between these three states. What you can also see again is that we get very nice agreement between the simulations shown in red and between the experiments shown in black. And this again means that we can resolve the conformations that underlie these thread efficiencies from our computer simulations. And what we find is that at low thread efficiency, the RNA molecule um, is, is unfolded. So therefore we have a large distance between our fluorophores corresponding to this high um, thread efficiency, uh, to the low thread efficiency down here. If we increase the magnesium concentration to the physiological uh, concentration, the riboswitch uh, goes into this active state, which, which is characterized by the so-called kissing interaction between the two stem loops. And finally, if I go to very high magnesium concentration, we find a misfolded state called the M state. And in this state, we have a high fat efficiency and the fluorophores are close together. Yeah, and what this shows is that this combination of simulations and FRED experiments is particularly well suited to really understand how uh, the mechanism of controlling gene regulation by magnesium works like, because we can resolve those individual states and even resolve a third state in this riboswitch which corresponds to a misfolded and non-functional state. In the simulations, um, so I'm sorry, there should be a movie. I don't know why it's not showing it. Um, I will try to play it. Ah, so, okay, maybe I can stop. So in the simulations, we can go one step further. So what we can do is we can take our coarse grained model, we can convert it back into all atom resolution. And in this all atom resolution, look at how this ligand, uh, ligand recognition mechanism uh, works. And uh, so what you can see here is we have two stem loops. In these stem loops, we have the binding side of the guanidinium ion. And here you can see a zoom in into this binding side. This is the guanidinium ion um, that comes in. And what we see in the in this movie is now that initially the binding side is blocked by three water molecules. And it actually takes quite a, a long time until we will see a flip of this dihedral backbone here, which then releases the water and allows the guanidinium ion, uh, ion to go into the binding pocket. Okay, so um, with this, I'm at the large part and I would like to introduce you to lipid nanoparticles. So using RNA molecules in, in medicine is a field that is growing at a really incredible fast pace. And I think this is, well, due to the pandemic, of course, well, of course, RNA medicine got a much, uh, much more momentum and many, many studies have been done. However, the biggest barrier toward using RNA molecules in medicine is the question, how can we deliver the RNA to the correct cells? And how can we protect the fragile molecules from rapid degradation? And now in this context, lipid nanoparticles proved to be particularly well suited. And in this uh, last part, I would like to show you our progress in simulating these complex and large um, nanoparticles. Okay, so this is a snapshot of a lipid nanoparticle from our simulation. And in general, these lipid nanoparticles have different uh, components. One component is cholesterol, which is shown uh, in white here. We have uncharged lipids uh, shown in orange. 
we have the ionizable lipids shown in green. And these ionizable lipids really are the key for these lipid nanoparticles to work because they can change the degree of protonation as a function of pH. And this is in essential in order to efficiently capture um, the RNA molecules to then transport them and finally release them again in the cells. What you can also see here now in red is this RNA cargo inside of the lipid nanoparticle. Now for, for lipid nanoparticles, there are many, many questions that are still open. So one question is the structure and distribution of the RNA inside of these lipid nanoparticles. Another question is what is the best composition of lipids for the most efficient transport? Um, or questions how the molecular mechanism of RNA release is really working. And of course, to answer all these questions, molecular dynamic simulations would be a really great tool to gain a deeper understanding. So the first step, what we need to do is we have to find accurate force fields in order to describe the system. And here we face another challenge, which I call the multi-component challenge. So we need accurate atomistic models for each of those components. And we have to make sure that the models are compatible. And this is something that's very challenging in MD simulation because in general, this is not the case. This is not like Lego. You cannot just put together force fields uh, that were developed with different optimization protocols. This can really lead to unexpected, in some cases, really unphysical behavior. So our aim was to develop a consistent approach and a consistent way to realistically model these lipid nanoparticles. So what we did here is we um, have an amber-based approach, which means we have uh, force fields, good force fields for cholesterol, uncharged lipids, and RNA. So the only thing what was left uh, to parameterize were the ionizable lipids. And this we did in a three-step optimization procedure. In the first step, we used um, higher level quantum chemical calculations to derive um, the parameters of the lipid head group in the neutral and in the cationic form. We then simulated a very simple bilayer system. And from these simulations, we, uh, we are able to calculate the scattering length density, which simply corresponds to the density of the atoms in our system. And we then teamed up with experts on Newton reflectometry experiments. And in these Newton reflectometry experiments, you can gain detailed information about the structure in thin films by measuring the reflection as a function of the momentum transfer vector. Now, from the simulations, we can again directly calculate back on this uh, reflectivity profile without any model assumptions. Uh, and what you can see here in black, you can see the experiments from, from neutron reflectometry and on top in blue, the results uh, from our newly um, developed force field parameters. And again, they agree quite nicely. And I think with this, uh, we, can, we can do the next step uh, and we can now bridge, if you like, from quantum chemical calculations really to simulating full nanoparticles. So these are our first simulation of such a lipid nanoparticles this is a system that consists of 2 million atoms. You can see the wiggling and jiggling of the lipids in this particle. Um, usually they are spherical. Here you can see a cut through this lipid nanoparticle. And again, you can see the RNA, how it is distributed inside of this particle. So with this, I'm at the end of my talk. I think I've stayed uh, well in time, um, but let me take the time to, to summarize uh, the results. So what I showed you today is that cations uh, and ionizable lipids really are essential uh, for, for RNA, for structure, function, and for transport. And that molecular dynamic simulations are really a great way to gain a very detailed understanding of these systems. Um, however, we need good atomistic models in order to, to paint a realistic picture. And in order to do that, we develop optimized force fields that allow us to really closely reproduce experimental results. I showed you two examples how cations can change the structure and function. I showed you how cations can change the twist of DNA. And I showed you how uh, magnesium ions can be used to regulate gene expression. And finally, in the last part, I showed you first atomistic insights, how lipid nanoparticles uh, look like in our simulations. At the end, I would like to acknowledge the people who actually did this work. Um, Sergio Cruz did an amazing job and, on simulating DNA twist. 
Kara Krotz was the PhD student who optimized magnesium models. Um, Ibrahim Mod is uh, my PhD student who did the simulations on the lipid nanoparticles, and Sebastian Falkner did the work on the riboswitches. I also want to acknowledge uh, funding from all the funding agencies and special thanks to our collaboration partners. I think to push the field of molecular dynamic simulations forward, it is very essential to combine experiments and simulations. So I always appreciate if we get input from experiments, in particular, if you have methods that can gain really this high resolution that is really needed in order to improve um, our simulations. So thanks a lot for your kind attention. Thank you, Thank you for your talk and thanks for staying in time so well. Questions, please. Um, thank you for this wonderful um, talk. Um, I have two short questions. I mean, maybe maybe um, I missed it, but on the last um, um, this uh, uh, this um, uh, yeah exactly this one. What is this blue um, ah, uh, sheet there? I, I, I always I always I always I always I never mention it, and this question almost always comes. So this is a carbon nanotube. In reality, yes. it's not there. It's a simulation trick. So the problem is. We, we design our lipid nanoparticle, but we don't know how much water is inside. Yes. Now in the MD simulation, it would take forever for water molecule to go from the inside reservoir to the outside. So therefore we use the carbon nanotube, which allows rapid exchange of water between inside and outside. Um, this is why it's there. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I, I was confused because then yeah. I thought I misunderstood something. Okay, and, uh, but, but more fundamentally, um, I'm, I'm very, um, I mean, these, these simulations are so great um, to understand what is really happening at, at this at this scale. I mean, I, I'm always admiring this stuff, but of course, as an experimentalist, I always, um, you know, I want to have the much longer questions. Uh, <laughs> Me too, so, yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just kind of wondering about your perspective on how new hardware um, will um, in the future maybe get us to um, so, so how, how much time do I have to answer the question? <laughs> no, so I mean, I, 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 I can, no, no, I can, I can, I can, I can say it in short. I think these are really wonderful times to do MC, MD simulations because we have increasing computational power. But in addition, we're now using graphics card to run our simulation. And this really is a game changer because using GPUs accelerates these simulations by, by orders of magnitude. And this really opens up completely new possibilities. So I, I do think we can go longer and longer. And I mean, it's already been amazing over the past 30 years. I mean, we started with picoseconds and now we're already at microseconds and, and going beyond if we use these enhanced sampling techniques. So I really think uh, we can go there. So I, what I showed here is that we can go to millisecond timescales for this water exchange processes. Um, so I, I do think that there is hope, maybe not for hours, but I think milliseconds is something that we should be able to, to do in the near future. Especially the last row, please. <laughs> uh, I, I'm really, uh, you know, it's fantastic that you can simulate out this last lipid nanoparticle, but I think they are still somewhat smaller than the real lipid nanoparticles. Are. So, yeah. do you think you can scale it up to, like, even uh, like this five times more sizes? So, so this particle is now ten uh, nanometers in diameter. Um, I think if we want to go much bigger, it might make sense to use coarse graining um, to do it. I think doubling the size should still be reasonable. So, so for example, what I showed here, this is about one month on a supercomputer. Um, so if you double the size, it's like n squared for the computational time. Um, so it would take longer, but it should still be doable. Factor of five, I think there it gets really challenging. Beautiful work, thank you. Um, I have a question. So, so how difficult would it go be to look at the DNA DNA interactions, for example, attractive interactions that are induced by? Uh, I mean, I think manganese is, I think, the, the one thing that is very interesting because it's it's yeah. temperature dependent attraction. And then the other question is like trivalent ions, right? So trivalent ions immediately 
get your attraction. Mm -hmm. yes. And there's a lot of biological relevance to that. Can, can you even think about uh, I, I did, and these are exactly the, 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 the lines where we want to go. So we already simulated DNA, DNA interactions, and we could show that for sodium chloride solution, the two DNA would repel, and in magnesium chloride or calcium chloride, they would form those dimers. Um, manganese is something we always wanted to look at, but again, so there we are currently in the process of optimizing the force field. So again, we have the problem that what's out there in the literature is not good enough. And manganese is a bit more challenging because it's a transition metal. But manganese is something we definitely want to look into, and this will be the next ion that we will uh, parameterize, same as for, for trivalent ions. So um, usually it, it always looks very fast, what I show, but this force field optimization for magnesium took four years on a PhD student. So it is time consuming, um, but we will get there. And I think we can really contribute to a more accurate description. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Thank you very much, Nadine, again. Okay.